Jesus uses the word only two times in the Gospels. Paul uses it many times. Uh, the word is church. Uh, the word as it is commonly used today has changed from its original meaning. It's like the word gay. 50, 60 years ago, uh, the word meaned uh, somebody who is happy. Uh, today, it refers to somebody who is homosexual. The meaning of the word has changed. When Jesus first used the word church, it was a term for help and hope and healing. Uh, now the word typically means a building. A church is a building that Christians use. A mosque is a building that Muslims use. A synagogue is a building that Jews used. A church has become a divisive term. Uh, often Christians and Muslims and Jews are divided. Possibly you don't believe in Jesus because you see all the division in the world over religion. You want nothing to do with religion. And churches are often divided with each other. There are 7,000 Christian churches in the Washington, D.C. area. No one ever says, oh, look, how wonderful it is that all the pastors and youth pastors love each other. The first time Jesus used the word church was in response to Peter, who said to him, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replies, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He said the church is all people who put their faith in Christ that he's the Son of God. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. All of Satan's forces will not be able to stop the church. The church is the body of Christ, and it is the hope of the world. The church is the body of believers who carry the fullness of Christ to every corner of this world. Perhaps the only thing more unfathomable than the reality that God chose to enter into the world through Jesus Christ is the reality that he has chosen us to be his representatives, to take his fullness to every part of this world. Whether you're a teenager, single, married, parent, or grandparent, it should blow your mind that God trusts you to take his message and his love to every person you know. In your family, among your friends, your co-workers, your teammates. We need to get the church back to Christ's original meaning for it. This is the fifth in a series of messages called Jesus Curriculum. We're looking at some of the key Seven things Jesus taught his disciples. These are principles that Doug Poe, the, Doug po, Co, the founder of the fellowship, puts on the National Prayer Breakfast, uh, taught to Christian leaders in all 196 countries in the world. The first one is, what is the purpose? The purpose is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. The second is, what is the gospel? The gospel is not points we believe about Christ. The gospel is a person, and his name is Jesus. The third is, what is the work? We tend to be activists. We think the work is to get up and go and work. Jesus says, the work, first of all, is to believe in Jesus Christ. Before you go, you pray. Before you put out effort, you trust. The fourth is last week, what is the ministry? What is the ministry of the church? What's our purpose? What's our win? The ministry is reconciliation of people to God and people to each other. Now today, what is the church? The church is the body of Christ. 
A consultant used a five-point scale to measure the health of organizations. He suggested 4.25 and above is a flourishing organization. 4.0 is healthy. 3.75 and below is toxic. 4.0 is all right. It's nothing to get too excited about. It's, it's like kissing your sister. Uh, 3.75 is toxic. Nobody wants to be part of that kind of organization. So how do you get a healthy organization? How do you develop a healthy church? In Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul suggests a way. Turn to Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. If you want to use our Bibles under the seats, it's on page 1,175. What makes a healthy church? Paul suggests at least three things that make a healthy church. First, a healthy church is united by love. Paul writes, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He says, be completely humble. Humility is essential to love. It's when we think we're better than other people that we run roughshod over people and we hurt people. Paul says, be patient, bearing with one another in love. If we're to love other people, we have to be patient with them. How's your driving? We're to bear with one another in love. This means we're to suffer uh, with the challenging habits of our mate or roommate or coworker. Gary went through the terrible experience of losing his five-year-old daughter to brain cancer. The Sunday after she died, he decided to go to church. And he was sitting there all alone. About halfway through the service, a wave of emotion came over him, and he just started weeping. Well, the pastor asked him three or four days later, well, did anybody say anything to you after the service? Did anybody put their hand on you while you were crying and say, hey, it's okay? Did anybody talk to you after the service? He said, no. When I heard that, alarms began to go off in my mind. I thought, that can never happen at Portland Community Church. For somebody to come in that broken up and they get no indication that anybody cares. So I began to think about our team's that are in place that we need to strengthen and maybe new ones we need to start. So one team we have is our hosts. Our hosts stand at the front door and greet people as they come in and they stand at the name tag table and, and say hi to people. They, uh, they, they hand out prayer dares after the service and journals and uh, they talk to people. But I wondered, do they realize that if somebody like Gary could be walking in who's had a terrible loss and that their words can make a big difference our starting point class uh, I, I hold it three times a year and at the end of the class I ask people why are you here I mean what keeps you coming back what do you like about this church well a pastor asked a similar question in another church and uh, one gal said well the reason I'm a Christian is because of a greeter. She said, I was in a very bad time in my life, and I decided to go to church. I hadn't gone to church before, and it took every bit of courage I could muster to drive into the parking lot and walk into the church. And as I was walking in, I thought, I don't know if this is a good idea at all. And then somebody at the door said, welcome, we're so glad you're here. And she said, there was just something about it that made me feel I was really welcome. And I came into that service, I found a seat, and over the weeks I began to learn about a relationship with God through Christ, and I committed my life to Christ. Basically, I think you could say, I gave my life to Christ because of a greeter. Do you realize that when you do a role in the church, that it can have that big of an impact? You might think it's not that big a deal, but it can make a big difference in somebody's life. Mike is working on forming a welcome team. Uh, 
Welcome Team provides an expanded role to our hosts. Um, It'll be the, probably the same group, uh, only bigger and, and more. But, you know, he's going to give training on, you know, uh, you know, not only how we say hi and all that stuff, but uh, g- connecting people to each other and uh, introducing them to other people in the church and to, to follow up, looking for them week after week. And um, they're going to be looking for people like Gary, who may be sitting in the church and uh, uncomfortable or alone or they're crying. And they would never let Gary walk out with nobody talking to him. Let Micah know if you'd be interested in helping with that. Another team uh, that we have is our usher team. We have great ushers. But I thought, you know, we can't let somebody like Gary walk in, have to find his own way to a seat, and maybe go out and nobody talks to him. We need ushers that would help him find a seat as far forward as possible. We always know that people closest in the room are the most engaged. And they're not going to have, you know, heart-to-heart conversations, but maybe just a word or two enough to show him that they care. Paul mentions another characteristic of love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We're to spare no effort to keep the unity not get splintered. I think one of the ways people in churches get splintered today is over the partisan divide. Both sides today believe that if they lose the election in November, our country is doomed. And what makes it so different today is that both sides are using religious terms. They both feel they have a righteous cause. So if we want to not be splintered in the church with our brothers and sisters who may believe differently with us politically, we have to drop the religious terms. Religious terms suggest that if you don't believe with me, you're evil, you're wrong, you can't be a Christian. And then we just have to make the decision. I'm not going to let my political position separate me from another Christian who may believe there's a different way to do things. Notice we don't have to create the unity. It exists. All we have to do is maintain it. What's the source of the unity? Paul mentions seven things. There is one body. The body of Christ is all believers worldwide. We are one body. There's one spirit. If you commit your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you. That same spirit lives in another Christian. We all have the same spirit, so how can we be divided? Just as you were called to one hope, we all have the same hope that Jesus is coming again and he will make all things right. One Lord. We believe that there's only one way to the Father through Jesus Christ who is Lord over all. One faith. We all share the same faith that Jesus was raised from the dead. He's alive. He's the Son of God. One baptism. We all come to Christ the same way. We admit that we've sinned. We confess our sin. We we say, God, I need you in my life. And we get baptized. The sign that we've given our life to Christ. And one God and Father of all. There's only one God in this world. He's the Father of all human beings. So we don't want to let ourselves get divided. A healthy church is united by love. Second, in a healthy church, everyone helps in some way. Paul says in verse 7, but to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Uh, By God's grace, every believer is given some abilities to serve Christ in this world and in the church. When every Christ follower uses his or her gifts in ministry, we develop a healthier church. 
Paul goes on, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Paul tells us that apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers were given to do some of the work in the church, but not all of it. Their main job is to build up others and teach others and strengthen others so they can get in the game too. Pastors not to do all the work, but to prepare other people to join them. When something's not done in a church, it's easy for us to say, what's wrong with the pastor? We pay them to do this. When all people are involved in some avenue of ministry, a church is far healthier. Paul says in verse 16, From him the whole body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As each part does its work. That's you and me. Paul likens the church to a body. When I drove in here this morning, I stopped at a stoplight. I saw that it was red. And my eyes communicated with my foot to move from the accelerator to the brake. Now, what if my body did not function properly? What if my eyes didn't detect the right color because they're all mad at something the nose did? Or the foot decided, you know, I don't like being bossed around all the time. I'm just going to keep it rammed on the gas. Or the foot was hurting, but he was too proud to tell the, the other foot that he had to step in and step on the brake. Well, any of those cases, there could have been an accident. Likewise, the parts of the church, that's you and me, have to work together. When we don't all help in some way, we cause burnout in other members who are doing more of the work. You can always tell when people are getting burned out. I begin to hear phrases like, nobody helps in this church. Nobody cares. We never have enough volunteers. I have to do it all myself. Health occurs when everyone chips in and does their part. Now, when I say everyone does their part, please understand that your, own, your service to Christ is not just in the church. Most of your service happens during the week to your family and friends and classmates and teammates and co-workers. Jack McMillan started working for Nordstrom when he graduated from college. He began as a shoe salesman. He worked his way up to senior leadership at Nordstrom. It helped that he married one of the Nordstrom daughters. From 1971 to 1995, he served as the co-president and co-chairman of Nordstrom, along with the Nordstrom cousins, Bruce, Jim, and John. In 1976, Jack, along with seven other members of the Nordstrom family, bought the Seattle Seahawks. They sold them in 1988. Jack has said that if he knew that they were going to win the Super Bowl a few years ago, he never would have sold. Years into his marriage, his wife got interested in Christian faith. And she invited him to a marriage encounter weekend. And he went, and there he gave his life to Christ at the age of 45. He came home from that conference, and for the first time in his life, he prayed with his wife and five children. And he decided from that point forward that he was going to live to serve Christ, not just himself. And he was going to get home from work sooner to spend more time with his family. And he began working with the fellowship, working on the, putting on the annual Washington State Prayer Breakfast and the annual King County Prayer Breakfast he met with a group of men to study the Bible and pray for each other, like our discipleship groups do. He met with Bruce, Jim, and John, the other members of the senior leadership team, every day. 
He was part of the whole decision that Nordstrom's number one priority was going to be customer service. He helped forge the company training. Use your best judgment in all situations. There will be no additional rules. They decided they were going to entrust their employees in all situations with the customer to use their best judgment. Another thing they taught, never say no to a customer. One of the most classic examples of that was a, a gal that stood at a, a counter in Nordstrom and a guy marched in with tire chains. He says, I want you to take these back. She said, did you buy these at Nordstrom? Yes. And on the spot, she made the decision to give him $59.99 for his change, even though everybody knows Nordstrom does not sell tire chains. That's how much the senior leadership trusts their employees to use good judgment. Jack served Christ at Nordstrom and has continued to serve Christ in the Seattle area. Let him tell his story. We just watch. He was a Swedish immigrant and he had a buddy that was a shoe repair man and they decided to open a shoe store. He had three sons and the three of them ran the business as a team. They were of one mind about the business. Everett Elmer and Lloyd Nordstrom, Lloyd was my father-in-law. I came along in 1957. I started selling women's shoes. I didn't know much about selling. I didn't know much about shoes. And I didn't know much about women. We never had a CEO or somebody who was uh, one man in charge. So the four of us became a team, being honest, working together, seeing the best in others. The team approach is something that we always emphasized and still do today. I had a good job and the company was doing well and we had a green lawn and a nice car and we were looking good. My wife, she says, uh, I thought you'd like to know that I've decided to join the Catholic Church. I said, okay, you, you go ahead and do that. You join the Catholic Church, but leave me out of it. When you're growing up, trying to figure out who you are and where you're going, you meet somebody, you fall in love. Well, what follows that second stage romance? It's disillusionment. And she came to me one day. She said, would you go to marriage encounter with me? I said, sure. I felt totally convicted of selfishness. I went home after that weekend and got our five kids together and prayed with them for the first time. I think they thought I was nutty. That started my journey to uh, follow Christ. And so those 23, four, that's 37 years I've been on that, that journey. And I bumped into this group of guys about uh, 20 years ago that were doing the work of Christ informally. And we started to meet regularly around the principles of Christ. And our idea was to work for the state of Washington to connect believers together. You know, God has placed you where you are. You're in a position of some influence. So just do what you're doing. It's been really gratifying to see the way that things have developed. Uh, we're involved in the National Prayer Breakfast, the Washington Governor's Prayer Breakfast, the King County Prayer Breakfast, uh, the Washington Student Leadership. We kind of make the, the climate, create the climate where those things can develop and grow much as the Nordstrom team had done for Nordstrom for uh, winning the state of Washington for Christ. Matthew 25, 40, whatever you do for the least of my brothers, you do unto me. I want to please God rather than please man. That's probably the overall 40,000 foot view of the way I view my faith. So he's been trying to serve Christ in the Seattle area.
So in a healthy church, everyone serves in some way. Finally, a healthy church helps people grow to maturity in Christ. Paul says in verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. A human being needs food and exercise to be healthy. We can't just take in food, we have to exercise. It's the same with a spiritual body. We can't just take in spiritual food, we have to serve and exercise to grow strong in our faith. When we're all serving, we grow stronger as followers of Christ. Paul goes on, verse 15, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him the whole body, joined and held together in every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. There Paul says it again. As each part does its work. As we each do our part, together the whole church grows healthier. And grow stronger. When the war uh, was going on in Sarajevo, a uh, American reporter was there, and he saw a little six-year-old girl get shot by a sniper. Tore off skin in the back of her head, and she was bleeding. And a man was holding her. He dropped his stuff and went to the man and helped them get into his car. And he stomped on the accelerator to get to the hospital as fast as he could. As he was driving, the man was holding the child in the, in the back seat. And he says, hurry, my child is still alive. And he kept driving and he said, he said, said another time, hurry, my child is still breathing. And then he said, hurry, his voice more urgent, my child is still warm. And they were almost there and he said, hurry. My child is getting cold. By the time they got to the hospital, the girl had died. And as the two men were washing their hands in the restroom and washing uh, blood off of their clothes, the man who had been carrying the child said, now this is the hardest part. I have to go tell the girl's father that his little girl died. And the reporter looked at him with amazement. He said, I thought, I thought you were her father. I thought she was your child. He says, no, but aren't they all our children? All people in the world that are suffering is our concern. There are people all around the world. There are people in Portland. There are people where you work. There are people in your school. People in your family. People in this church who are suffering. And Christ has called us to be the fullness of Christ, to look out for people like that everywhere we go and serve them. You only have between this day and your final day to make a move for God. Isn't it time for you to make your move? Let me just summarize our takeaways. The church is the body of Christ probably more unfathomable than the fact that God chose to become a man in Jesus Christ is the fact that He has chosen us, His followers, to take His fullness everywhere we go in the world. It's unbelievable that He trusts you and me to do that. A healthy church is united by love. We work to keep love going in our body. In a healthy church, everyone helps in some way. We all serve. We all do our part. And a healthy church helps people grow to maturity in Christ. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can do so right now as we pray. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. Come into my life. And tell God that as a member of the body of Christ, you want to take His fullness everywhere you go this week. Lord Jesus, thank you for the amazing truth that you trust us 
to take you to our families and friends and coworkers and classmates. It's just, it blows our minds. I want to give you a chance to pray right now. You tell God, thank Him for that, do, that awesome responsibility that you want to do it this week. You pray. Lord Jesus, remember that we are the body of Christ called to take your fullness wherever we go this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.